Hi, I'm Leslie McVeigh, the Development Director at Portland Media Center. And today I am interviewing someone who is getting ready to do something that very few people in the world have done. No one from Maine has done, and he will be the youngest person to do this. And my guest is Sammy Potter, and his, his uh, feat that he's about to undertake is known as the Triple Crown of Hiking. Is that right, Sammy? Yeah, um, the calendar year triple crown. So the cal that's what I exactly, meant to yeah. say. That, no worries, right? no worries. All right, the calendar year, and only about ten people have done it. Yeah, exactly. I was speaking the other day with a, a historian of the of the trails, and he's only found nine folks who have done it. Um, you know, we like to leave like a little bit of room in there in case there's folks who haven't documented it or announced or anything. Um, but it's definitely a small list of folks who have done it for sure. And and why don't you explain what the triple crown is? The three. Sure. Trials. Yeah. Um, I think when, you know, obviously when people hear the words triple crown, they, they're usually thinking about horses. And um, this is a little bit different. I don't have any experience with, with horses. Um, so the triple crown of hiking is made up of the three uh, long distance trails in the United States. So that's the Appalachian Trail here on the East Coast, the Continental Divide Trail, which follows the Continental Divide, and the Pacific Crest Trail, which runs through um, California, Oregon, and Washington. So each of these trails is between uh, two and 3,000 miles, and together they all make up the, the Triple Crown. Which is about 8,000 miles. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's just, just under 8,000. Yeah, and it takes most people about three years to do it. In, in, they do like up to six months for each, each leg of the, of, the tri of the trip. Yeah, exactly. Usually, you know, when folks are, get into through hiking, they'll do uh, one, one through hike a year is, is pretty standard and itself like an amazing accomplishment. Um, and they, they kind of range between, you know, four, four and six months, depending on, depending on the trail. The longest is the Continental Divide, which is just under, under 3,000. Wow. That may be the longest, but it's not considered the most difficult, is it? No, that's a really good question. Um, actually, right here, right here in Maine, we have some of the most difficult trail uh, and overall, of those three trails, the Appalachian is is considered by far um, by far the most difficult because there's so much elevation change. Um, it's funny that the track that the elevation or that the Appalachian Trail follows uh, goes out of its way to hit like every mountain that possible on the East Coast, and um, you know because of that, there's I think there's something like a million feet of elevation or something like that. Yeah, and, and and you know we we have the end of that trail right here, and mm -hmm. and we you know we don't realize how um how prominent it is in the hiking world always totally yeah we have the um the hundred mile wilderness here at the end of the the appalachian trail when um you know when you hit monson you don't hit a town for another town for a hundred miles uh before you before you get to baxter and you know in the hiking community it's it's kind of marveled as like one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest accomplishments within uh within long distance hiking and it's pretty awesome that it's, it's right here in Maine. And I honestly didn't think about it much when I was, when I was growing up. And I, I don't think mo most folks here do. So let's talk about you. First of all, um, you have to have a, a whole year to do this. So you're a student at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And you've had some time off during the pandemic, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. So is that when you got this great idea to do this, that you know, you had some time to think about your life and what you want to do, and you are an active man. Um, so tell us how this came about. Yeah, totally. So uh, when the pandemic hit in, uh, you know, February or March, um, I, was, I was at Stanford at the time, uh, finishing up uh, my second quarter of, of my sophomore year. Uh, very quickly, it went from, you know, something that we were hearing about in the news to immediately being booted off campus. We were all, all of us students were asked to leave. Um, I came home back to Maine, and for that third quarter of, uh, of that academic year, I took classes online, and I also worked at um, Preble Street Homeless Shelter, because um, I, I was really curious what it would be like to work on the, the front lines uh, during, during this pandemic. Um, that's kind of around the time when I started thinking about what I wanted to spend this time doing. It, it was kind of a long process for me to realize that I wasn't going to go back to school for a long time, and school is a place that I love, so I was understandably really, really sad about that. And, uh, you know, I, it took a while, but eventually I just had to change my mindset and kind of think about instead of what burdens is this, is this situation giving me, what opportunities is this, is this also giving me that I, that I wouldn't have had if I was just in school. 
Um, and at that point, I, I had always been thinking about long distance hiking as something maybe I wanted to do. Um, you know, upon graduation, a lot of folks on the East Coast uh, attempt the Appalachian Trail um, after graduation or in interim periods of their life. And I started thinking about maybe doing, doing that this past summer. Um, talked to a lot of mentors and some other folks in the hiking community and, and learned about this, this insane challenge called the Calendar Year Triple Crown. And, uh, you know, I've been wanting for a, a long time to, uh, to do something like this where I'm just able to simplify my life and have one core goal that I'm devoting everything to. And this, this seemed like the perfect one. It, it really combines everything that I love, which is the outdoors, pushing myself physically and mentally and, you know, having a sense of purpose that's related to nature. And my, my family is, is definitely big into, big into the outdoors. Um, my mom is on a mission currently to hike all of the 4,000 footers uh, throughout New England. And she's pretty close. Um, so that, that tells you a little bit about, about who I was raised by. <laughs> You know, how do you get ready for something like this? You know, you've got to have gear, you've got to be in shape, you've got to, you know, think about, you know, what happens if you fall and injure yourself. Uh, tell us about how, you know, what the steps are. Totally, yeah. Um, you hit on, on a few of the big ones. I, I kind of have broken down the, the preparation for this, um, uh, for this insane challenge into three categories. Uh, one being physical training, as you mentioned, the second being gear, and the third being sort of overarching logistics. Um, training itself was kind of insane. I, I talked to uh, some former, former Triple Crowners about what they did, and uh, I won't bore you with the details, but it's a lot of running, a lot of hiking, and a lot of squats wearing like a backpack that's like 60 pounds. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, from there, uh, from there the, the gear was something I was, I was a little bit nervous about because you know, understandably, I'm, I'm a college kid. I, I'm, I was working at Preble Street, but I'm not a wealthy dude. You know, I was, I'm, just a, I'm just a college kid. And um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to get, um, to get L.L. Bean to supply most of our gear, which is, which is a huge blessing. Um, and then the third one, which, you know, it takes by far the most time, is trail logistics. And the reason that is is because these trails are, are really not built to be all hiked in one year. So you're inevitably going to hike some of them in winter, some of them in summer, some of them in fall, and then a bit of it in winter again at the tail end. Um, but navigating even when you're going to be able to hike which trail because of, um, because of what the environment is like uh, takes a lot of effort as well. So our first challenge that we're going to be, be tested with on the, on the first leg of the journey is the Smoky Mountains. Um, mm -hmm. So timing the Smoky Mountains, timing the White Mountains once you get up here to New Hampshire, timing Baxter State Park on the CDT, uh, timing the San Juan Mountains, as well as, um, as well as the Montana section. And then another big one is uh, timing the Sierra Nevadas in California. Um, so there's really only a few, few ways that you can logistically piece this trail to get, or piece these three trails together. And sort of navigating that was, was really difficult. And then the last one, which I, I forgot, and is a big one, is, is food. Um, you know, it takes a lot of fuel to do this. And uh, we've actually spent like the last two and a half weeks or so uh, basically dehydrating all the food that we're going to eat throughout the trail. Um, I'll send you, I'll send you folks some, some pictures of that afterwards because wow. it's like literally a mountain of, right. of, uh, of trail food, but that's a pretty big process as well. Um, our big constraints around this challenge are um, obviously finishing it within a year time span as, as is in the name. Mm -hmm. But for us, our goal is to get back to school um, at the end of September. So we're yeah. actually trying to trying to do this in just under under nine months, which puts us um, puts us puts us in a in a little bit more of a constraint as well. So that's pretty quick to to do it in that amount of time. Yeah, it is. It is quick. Uh, we're we're not going for any any speed record. Um, the speed record is uh, 252 days, and mm -hmm. we anticipate finishing it a little bit later than that, in about between 265 and 270 days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which is pretty close to the speed record, but. Is not is not any any one of the reasons why we're why we're doing it is to is to break a speed record. You know, we want to experience these trails yeah. as deeply as we can. But it it averages what about twenty seven miles a day or something like that. I... Yeah, it's definitely variable based on the trail. Like the Appalachian Trail, we're really only averaging like twenty three miles a day. Um, but the PCT and especially sections of the Continental Divide Trail that are just like on flat desert, you know, you can crank out miles there. Um, so in the end, it's going to average just over 30 miles a day, actually. Wow. So have you um, actually done part of each of those trails? 
Uh, yeah. I've never done any parts of the Continental Divide Trail oh. before. Um, so I, I'm, that's one of the, probably the one I'm most excited for because it's most new to me. Um, I've hiked a lot of the California section of the Pacific Crest Trail. And then, you know, being from Maine, I've hiked a lot of the Appalachian Trail um, everywhere north of, north of Pennsylvania. And also uh, I've hiked sections of it in Tennessee and North Carolina as well. Um, but I think the one I'm, I'm most excited for is definitely the CDT because it's really a part of the country I've, I've really hardly been to before. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I want to just go back to the food for a minute. Yeah. So what, what sort of things are, are you taking that you, you know, dehydrated or whatever? What, what are you taking? Totally. Yeah. Um, so I'll preface this by saying it's far from gourmet um, tra trail food. It, there's a saying in the trail community that the best spice is uh, the best spice is hunger which is definitely true after, you know, like a 25, 26 mile day or something. Um, so our, our breakfasts yeah. are um, generally pancakes and dehydrated pancakes uh, and oatmeal. Uh, we mix in some like raisins, almond butter, cinnamon, uh, spices here and there to, to spice things up. Um, throughout the day, we're mostly eating uh, granola bars. Uh, we made a huge thing of trail mix. Like we filled this massive bucket <laughs> um, with like mounds and mounds of trail mix. Um, and in that is all different time, types of nuts. So almonds, Brazil nuts, uh, cashews, hazelnuts, um, as well as granola. Uh, we mix in some Skittles for like a little bit of, of a sugar rush there. Um, and then we, we drizzled like our, uh, we drizzled it all in uh, maple syrup and then, uh, and then baked it. So it's that our trail mix is actually pretty gourmet, I think. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then for dinners, we're that doing. Sounds wonderful. It's, I'll, I'll, if I, if I get to see you sometime soon, I'll, I'll bring you a little bit so you can try it. All right. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then for dinners, we're doing, uh, beans and rice, uh, quesadillas, uh, and, um, and like cheesy mashed potatoes. So when I was working at Preble Street, um, after I finished up that job, I had some time when I wanted to cross train and wasn't starting any other job yet. Um, I had about three weeks before I was starting another job. And I decided to cross train. I would uh, bike down the East Coast. And along the way, I, I was fortunate enough to camp in the backyards of friends. I didn't like go into anybody's houses or anything because I was you know, too nervous about COVID, but I just like would yeah. camp in people's backyards. And one of my, one of my best buddies who, uh, who I go to Stanford with um, has a house in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. So I stayed there. Uh, we spent the next day together hiking in uh, the White Mountains uh, in New Hampshire. And throughout that process, I was telling him about this journey. His name is Jackson Perel, by the way. Um, I was telling him about this, this proposed journey I was thinking about because I still hadn't decided and asked him if he would join me for, for a section of it. Um, he said yes. And uh, then we spoke uh, about a week later or maybe two weeks later. And um, at the end of that phone call, decided that we would do the whole thing together. And wow. I kind of, I, I wasn't going to ask anybody to, to do it with me because, you know, it's an insane thing to ask somebody to do. <laughs> Um, but the fact that he was as crazy as me and wanting to do it, um, you know, showed me that he would be an awesome partner and it's, it's been a huge team effort since then. Yeah. It'd be nice too, to, to have that reference, you know, someone to, to, you know, 50 years from now, <laughs> sit around with, you know, our place and talk about that wonderful adventure you had. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, we've also, we've also already been through like a few, you know, tough times throughout, throughout like this preparation process with. Um, you know, for example, like uh, ordering food or, or figuring out like all these logistics. It's just it's really nice to have somebody to be to be in it with rather than trying to figure figure everything out, everything out yourself. Yeah. And, 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 it, and you know, that teamwork is, is nice um, when you're when you do come across something unexpected. It's nice yeah. to have someone else. What about books now? You have a Kindle or whatever those things are. All right. I don't read that way, but most people do, I guess. Yeah. So you can take as many books as you want with you on this trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually am. I'm kind of with you in that camp. I, I can't do Kindles. There's something yeah. about like a physical book that is just like way too important to me. Um, so we're trying to keep our pack weight as low as possible, um, you mm -hmm. know, so that we're able to, to do more miles and not get us tired. But one of the like, quote unquote, luxury items I, I always take when I go backpacking is, is a physical book. Um, and you know, I have like a long list of books that I'm, I'm planning to bring, but I'm, I'm definitely not going to carry all of them at once. I'll just bring one and then figure out how to pick up, pick up the rest of them, you know, throughout. Cause that, that would be a lot of extra weight. 
So then once you do the first trail, how do you get to the second trail? Yeah, so so we're we're doing the Continental Divide Trail second, um, which begins yeah. in New Mexico and goes all the way up to um, to Montana. Um, so we're we're unfortunately going to have to take a plane flight for that. We looked into like all sorts of options of how we could uh, transport from one trail to the other. Um, so we're unfortunately going to have to take one flight there. Um, uh -huh. but we, we're, you know, we're kind of rationalizing it in the sense that we'll be able to quarantine or quote unquote quarantine by being in isolation on the Appalachian Trail two weeks before. And then when we begin that trek, we'll also be isolating in the in the New Mexico wilderness um, in terms of in terms of the COVID situation. So we'll have to take a plane there, though. Yeah. And then after that trail, you go the trail and you'll get there how like just uh yeah so uh the northern terminus of the continental divide trail and the northern terminus of the uh pacific crest trail are mm -hmm. definitely drivable it's like a very it's a quite a long distance um so we'll either take a we'll either take a flight there or be able to drive it if we can navigate renting a car i'm hoping by that situation it's a little it's a little um, safer to fly and and you know we won't have to think too much about that but that's kind of something we'll have to evaluate when we're when we're getting a little yeah. closer and talking about safety um in many ways now i mean we're all we all think about all the time now totally. what are you taking with you for medical supplies yeah um a lot is the short answer <laughs> um in in terms of the covid situation you know we're taking lots of ppe um, as well as a ton of hand sanitizer, uh, medical gloves, uh, masks, you know, the, the regular things there. Um, in addition to that, we have a first aid kit and a foot health kit. Um, in our first aid kit, we have everything from, uh, you know, Imodium to antihistamine to, um, uh, you know, issues for dealing with uh, ticks, um, as well as scissors, bandages, cravats, um, uh, tweezers, you know, just the, those typical things. And then the biggest one that I think I'm worried yeah. about is, is foot health um, because, you know, putting, put, we'll be putting so much stress on our feet that we, we really have to take care of them. Um, and for that, we have tons of moleskins, uh, sort of different kinds of specialized cream that, um, that decrease friction between our socks and our, and our feet, um, as well as, you know, things for taking care and, and um, draining blisters as well. Yeah. And how many pairs of shoes are you taking to an extra in case or how does that work with? Yeah. With so it's, it's actually insane how many pairs of shoes we're, we're likely to go through. Um, I've talked to, you know, a few triple crowners before, as I mentioned, and the amount of shoes that they use throughout this journey uh, range from uh, 12 to 18, depending on who you talk to. Um, wow. wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm someone who like hates to buy new shoes. I, I try to get, I, I literally use them until they're like, not even shoes anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. But for this, I think, you know, we want to have like super, super good protection. So we're, we're only bringing one pair at a time, but there are certain places that will be um, throughout the journey where we'll be able to order shoes a few days ahead and then pick them up when our the shoes that we're currently wearing are, are getting too old. And that's where you'll have mail or whatever, and make contact with people. Exactly. Yeah, that's where we'll have resupply boxes uh, or have our resupply boxes mailed for um, food or, you know, if there's some uh, medical thing that we need to need to get taken care of as well. That'll be great. Well, I'm, I'm really excited for you and um, for all of us in Maine, what, you know, hearing about you doing this great adventure and representing representing the state as you know, I think of it that way. Um, what, what do you hope in the end to come away from this? Uh, how do you hope, hope to feel coming away from this? Or, or have you not thought about that? Is it all about going forward and not thinking about, you know, how this will be for you in the end? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I just want to touch on what you mentioned about, about Maine. Um, yeah. Throughout like this whole journey of, of planning this, I think one of the things I've realized is I think Maine is pretty underrepresented in the hiking community. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's great hikers all over, all over the country, but you know, as, as we were speaking about before, Maine has some of like the best hiking in the world. And I just, I personally think it's very underrated. So that's, that's one of my goals in, in this is to, is to, is to bring a little bit more attention to, to hiking in the, in Maine as well. Um, on, on your other question, um, you know, I, I've thought a lot about it and, 
I think the biggest thing that I'm that I'm looking for uh, throughout this throughout this journey is to like feel a really pure sense of freedom um, as well as purpose. Uh, especially in this past year, I think I've kind of been starved for like a sense of purpose and and meaning. And we we're speaking about Thoreau earlier, and he has this quote that I really love, um, which is that so many people are living lives of quiet desperation. And that term really stuck out to me this past year. I felt like I was kind of stuck in one place and um, you know, quietly desperate for, for something out there. Um, and that, that's a feeling that I, that I, I feel uh, really fulfilled when I'm, when I'm in nature. And uh, I think throughout this, I, I just want to explore like how, how far I can push that and how, how in, touch with, um, in touch with the nature around me I can, I can, I can get. Um, and I don't think there's any, any better way to do that than, than basically living outside for like nine months. Uh, yeah. So who knows if that'll happen, but I'll keep you updated. I think that's wonderful. And, and, and after this, what's next? I, you do the long trail in Norway. Have you heard about that? The I have, yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. Has Roger had a, had a chance to do any of that? I'm sure he's. Oh, <laughs> we're going to wait and have you do it. Okay. That sounds good. It's a pretty epic trail. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, thank you for, um, you know, spending the time with us. And we look forward to hearing more from you along the trail and see how that goes and send us footage, send us any kind of information. Maybe we could do some Zooms. I don't know how that'll work. But however, we can keep in touch with you and share with the people in Maine would be great. That sounds awesome. Uh, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. And it's, it's, it's great to see you as well. Yeah. And as Roy Rogers said, happy trails. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Bye, Sammy.